Hello, my name is Heidi Seibold and today I want to talk about research software engineers and a role for open and reproducible research. I work at the LMU in Munich and the University of Bielefeld. So why do I care about this topic? Who am I? I am a uh, statistician or you could also call me a data scientist and um, I care a lot about good software for stats. So I'm a maintainer and contributor to several R packages. I teach R, statistics, reproducibility and open science. I'm an assistant editor for the Journal of Statistical Software, a member of the LMU Open Science Center, an expert of open scholarship for knowledge exchange and many other things that revolve around both technical stuff and um, open science and computational reproducibility. So this is um, how I got into this whole idea. And when I do talk about open science, I talk about things like making code reusable for others, preprints. I'm a big fan of, pu of publishing preprints. Um, I tell people to use version control because that's like the tool that's made me feel the most confident about um, not losing my work. And essentially, I'm like, why don't we as researchers who are paid by the taxpayer just make everything available for everyone because everyone is paying us, so we should also give our results to everyone. But then um, I start showing which tools I use and then it gets technical really quickly. And so in the following, I will be showing you which tools I use. Um, you might be a bit overwhelmed with all the technical stuff that I'm using to do open and reproducible research. Um, and then I'll show you a solution that I think is a great solution for this um, situation where researchers are overwhelmed with um, yeah, how to do open science and reproducibility in a smart way. So this is uh, my toolkit or at least parts of my toolkit that I use for making my work open, making my work reproducible, reusable and so on. So um, let's start here on the top left. I use version control for versioning um, yeah, my, my texts, but also my code and everything. Um, I use automation um, as that's a very important part of making stuff reproducible. In my opinion, I try to document um, my work as best as I can so that others can actually understand what my work is about. Um, I try to be very organized in the sense that I try to have a good folder structure so that others can use my stuff, but also organized in the sense that I try to organize my life in a way that I get shit done. And finally, I try to publish my stuff on uh, the right, at the right places. So publishing code, for example, on GitHub or GitLab, um, being online, doing science communication, for example, on Twitter, having websites and so on, publishing um, material on things like the open science framework, uh, publishing benchmarking results on the open machine learning platform um, that I'm contributing to as well and publishing obviously preprints and then also journal articles. So if now you look like this because all the tools that I showed are like Ooh, so scary um, because you've never heard of make before or docker then uh, don't worry. Um, this is normal because open science and reproducible research require tremendous software skills. So what I want to do in the future, because I don't think that every researcher can 
do this whole thing on their own is help them. So I want to be able to have researchers use modern tools without getting completely frustrated. And I think um, that's very important because we want to all, I believe that everyone wants to do good research or most of us want to do good research, but we just need to help each other in doing so. So what do we need for that? We need uh, people who develop helpful tools that are easy to use. We need people who help researchers with finding and learning that good tools. We need people who support researchers with reproducibility and especially with computational reproducibility because that's often the part that people are most scared of. Um, and we need people who support researchers in writing scripts and software. So, um, yeah, these are just things that researchers, in my view, need help with in order to do good, open and reproducible work. And these people that can help I would call research software engineers and the community calls them research software engineers. So short RSEs. So I believe that research software engineers can help with this problem. For example, I could imagine something like a code clinic that researchers go to and say, hey, I really want to make my analysis script reproducible. Can you help me with that? And then the research software engineer says, hey, sure, of course, uh, come in and we'll figure it out together. Um, so what's the problem? Um, when research software engineers meet someone and they're being asked, hey, so what do you do? And they say, well, I'm a research software engineer. Then people often really don't know what that means. So I want to shed a bit of light onto the term and then... Um, it will become clear why they are the right people to help researchers. So I'll go into a couple of examples of research software engineers. So such personas that um, resemble classical research software engineers that you might currently think are just normal researchers, but they're a bit more than that because they have software skills that are tremendously important. So let's start with um, this PhD student. She um, works in computational biology, is really into code. She um, needed to write her own software as part of her PhD and she's really liking and enjoying that and would like to extend her software even further. But her um, supervisor tells her to um, think also about writing papers and not to work too much on her software in the end. Then uh, there's this really nice guy at your institution that always helps if you have any kinds of computer problem. Um, so he's actually employed as a, as a normal employee at the um, university or research institution. Um, so he's, for example, a researcher, but he's really nice and excited to help other people when they have computer problems. Then there's a researcher and she um, needed to learn how to use software and write software as part of her work. She learns what she needs, but um, she really wants to focus on her research. Then uh, there's this guy who's really very much into reproducibility. He learns everything he needs to to understand how to make his work reproducible and learns all these kinds of things like Docker, version control and so on that are very technical and he's very excited about learning that. And then there's um, the software person. She's hired by uh, as part of a research project to specifically create software for the project. Um, so for example, she might create um, software for an online survey that's then automatically being analyzed um, straight away. But um, she gets an offer from a company that values her skills apparently much more and pays her much more, so she leaves academia um, because she has not no good chances of having a 
great career in academia. Um, and then there's people like me who are like super excited about <laughs> research, super excited about code as well. And um, yeah, I'm still here. I'm still in academia and I'm trying to figure out my personal path um, through the academic jungle where I can be both a research software engineer and a person who cares about open science and someone who does also some research. So these are all these people who make a lot of benefits for academia, right? So for the research itself. So what would happen if we would not have people anymore who enjoy coding or who enjoy um, working with software? I think we would have a very low chance of reproducibility at all, especially computational reproducibility. We have, would have a low quality of research outputs. Um, software and scripts would not be reusable for other projects. Um, we would have, in general, a lot of reinvention of the wheel because if software is not reusable, then people have to re-implement software for every specific purpose there is. Um, we would have a much slower progress than we would have with uh, research software engineers. Um, in general, these things like big data, data science, AI, they're all things that wouldn't be possible without people who enjoy coding. And well, essentially, it would also mean that everyone would need to learn everything in the sense that if we don't have specific people who focus on software and code, then everyone has to do it. So the problem is, well, if I create software, then I'm not creating a paper. If I help people with their software, then I'm not writing a paper. But at the same time, papers are valued so much more than software. And additionally, since that leads to the fact that if you focus on software, you cannot go the classical career path potentially and become a professor at some point or get a permanent position, there's really limited a career possibilities for um, software developers in research. And I have to say also that research software engineers are not the same as IT stuff. Um, they, a lot of them have a PhD. So you see here below, you see the results from a, a survey conducted, I think in 2018 of uh, research software engineers and they reported so this is research software engineers in Germany and they reported um, having really a lot of them had at least a master's degree um, many of them even had a PhD so um, these are people that are highly educated they have an intricate knowledge of research which they need to have in order to understand the software for the research um, so they're not the same as IT staff and they're not going to be hired as IT staff. They'd rather go to companies instead. So it's a really awkward situation. At the same time, RSEs are not getting the support and career that they deserve um, as a qualified parts of the research community that they are. Um, and at the same time, research doesn't work without RSEs. So we the more computational re research becomes and already most of the research is to a certain extent computational, um, the more research depends on RSEs. So what do we do? And in essence, we need to make the situations better for RSEs so that we as researchers can um, benefit from their knowledge. So, um, what we do is we join forces with other people who care about this. And so in Germany, we now have a, an association, Verein, um, Gesellschaft für, für Forschungssoftware, so Association for uh, Research Software. And um, this association also has a website 
Um, we had our first conference last year. We planned on having a second conference this year, but you know what the situation is like. And we also have regional chapters. So in Munich, for example, we have a mailing list and we had a couple of meetings where we met with other research software engineers or people who care about research software. And this is a growing community um, that started um, in the UK. So in the UK, it's essentially started with the Software Sustainability Institute and a and yeah, just f coining the term essentially. That was a big important step. That was in March 2012, and then the German group. Um, was started in September 2016 at an RSE conference in the UK and then the association was formed in November 2018 and as I said we had our first conference last year which was really great and it was so nice to see that so many other people in Germany care about research software so What's my talk about? Um, essentially, I want to tell you um, that RSEs are important and we need to allow RSEs to have a proper academic career with good outlooks uh, and non-permanent positions at some point, uh, permanent positions at some point. And um, yeah, research needs these people, especially open research so we can't just ignore the situation yeah so my slides are available online they're also um, openly licensed under cc by license and i'm happy to talk to you if you have any questions